A global map is essentially some sort of visual depiction of a process or a pattern that we can see that gives us some context for the biodiversity, the, the life that's there, um, the, the ecosystem functions that those species or those organisms do while living there. In the context of the global restoration movement, we had a lot of restoration organizations come to us and one of the biggest questions we were getting was, what should we be planting? Um, so actually with uh, these models, we can recommend species that are adapted to the environment, to the soil, to the climate, um, and that are also native. But I think maps are an awesome way of depicting scientific results that show these um, interactions and the bigger picture, and they just look awesome. Well, a global map is kind of a way to depict scientific results on a global level. So you have information on, for example, ecological characteristics, and for every place on the Earth, you know how this characteristic is described for that specific location. This can be anything. For example, it can be how many trees there are, what kind of trees there are, maybe what mammals live there, how many birds are there, what kind of birds are there, so anything in nature. Uh, the more time I spend working with maps and creating maps, uh, the more I see the value in uh, displaying the information in a map form. I really think this can help communicate uh, information in a much, much more easy way than, for example, a table or some other, to display that information. Otherwise, it would be a lot more complicated. Global maps are actually built on local data. Um, the, the models are fed and informed by thousands of studies all across the globe, not just restoration groups, but also scientific studies and experiments across the globe. So these global maps really are local in nature, and they really depend on people sharing data and generating data and giving it to the scientific community such that we can then create these products and share that back with them. So my favorite map is a map I found in a secondhand store uh, that's now on a wall in my room, and it's an old map of Switzerland that's probably a few hundred years old. I don't know if it's original, um, but it has really funny or old names for uh, for cities, for example, Martini is Martinach, and it makes me think of Asterix and Obelix, the comic book. I can try to explain it with an example on a very basic level. So if you think about Ibex in Switzerland, when you travel through Switzerland, you, you sometimes get to places where you see Ibex and where you don't see Ibex. And in your head, you kind of then start creating a model of what kind of environment do Ibex like to live in? And then you kind of, for every place in Switzerland, when you know how the environment is, you can predict kind of, is there an Ibex or not? What do Ibex need to live in Switzerland? Um, usually they need high altitudes, rocky places. They live in the mountains and they yeah, rather like colder weather than hot weather, I think. But I'm not a specialist in Ibex. So it's actually much more simple in some ways than that, I guess. Um, we map each species separately. Uh, so just a presence of a species is one, absence of a species is zero. Um, so we just have, you can imagine a global map where you have ones everywhere where we know that species is and um, zeros sort of distributed evenly ar around the map. Um, and then from that, our models will link those ones and zeros to environmental um, layers and layers about soil and that's how we will then figure out the distribution of the species. So I, I think there's a couple different values in global maps. First off there's this just natural interest that we have and global maps really give us great context for understanding the world around us. Um, we can look at these and really start to see this variation at the global scale in, in ecosystems. So I think, first off, it fills this just natural human curiosity, which is at the core of, of science. Um, but then again, global maps are really critical because they also can inform um, policy, they can inform restoration movements, they can inform conservation. And so they have this really critical applied aspect as well. Um, and so this curiosity really feeds in and can help to address critical issues that uh, society is facing as a whole. A lot of restoration organizations are super motivated to restore some, some area um, and are super motivated to plant trees and other plants, um, but sometimes they just don't know what to plant. Um, so we've actually had uh, organizations come to us and ask us, 
can you send us a list of species that I could plant here um, and to do responsible restoration. We want to recommend planting native species as opposed to invasive species.